Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our next camera series video. Uh, I don't typically go into a lot of detail about the specific camera that I'm talking about, but I'm going to uh, spend just a minute on this one. This was my first twin lens reflex camera. It remains my only TLR, actually. And the um, uh, I picked this up for $14 at an estate sale, and when I bought it, I kind of bought it on faith. I had no idea whether it worked or not. There was so much kitchen grease on the lens inside and out that I couldn't even see the shutter holding it up to light. And the outside was covered in shoe polish, so it took me uh, it took me about five hours of taking it apart and cleaning it one evening to get it to work. I actually had to take the lens assembly apart because the aperture control arm wasn't connected to the aperture anymore. Excuse me. But that said, uh, it's a great old camera and it's, very, it's a very in important camera for me because it's my oldest camera, I believe. Uh, not the oldest I've ever owned, but the oldest I own right now. And, we'll get to this in a little bit in the video, but this is one of the oldest old standards out there. And I don't know exactly how many still exist, and I don't know what the lowest serial number still in existence is, but this one has a really low serial number. So, uh, at any rate, we'll get to that in a, in a little bit later in the video. So now, we'll get back to the camera in general. This is a fixed lens, twin lens reflex camera. Now what that means, and it's a little bit different, in fact it's a lot different than most of the cameras we've looked at so far, there are two lenses on the front of the camera. There you can see them over here. We've got, this is called the taking lens, and this is called the viewing lens. So when you're looking through the viewfinder, which is up at the top, you look down through it, you would look through the image which is being generated by the viewing lens. This is a fixed f3.1 helio... helioscope anastigmat lens. Oops, all of the old standards had that exact same lens, and I think a few of the the cameras after this one did, but I'm not a Raleigh expert, so don't quote me. Then this one, there were three models of old standard. Uh, and this one has a 3.8, an f3.8 Zeiss lens. And we'll get to the different models in a bit. This camera has no meter in it. It predates metering in cameras, so you, if you, when you use this, you have to take a meter along with you. And you can get those for your smartphone now, and they're really very accurate. Uh, or you can use an old selenium-type pocket meter, which look really cool and are also very accurate. The shutter speeds are T, B, and 1 second through 1 300th. Many old standards, the shutters aren't perfectly timed anymore. I'm really lucky with this one, it is. Um, the TLR, v oh, we did that. Uh, the TLR image, what you see on the viewing screen, and we'll take a look at that later in the video, is near enough as makes no difference to 100% of frame coverage, which is amazing considering that this takes six by six images and there's a big sheet of six by six view finding glass up at the top. The standard ground glass uh, focusing screen. Uh, it came with it. There were interchangeable options, and there are still third-party options available for this camera, which you can get. They're very expensive, hundreds of dollars. But apparently they can make a big difference. Um, honestly, the viewfinder in these old cameras, to my eyes, is bright enough that it's not really needed, and I can do a pretty good job focusing with this. Uh, one is using a magnifying loop. There's a glass built into this, but if you use a loop, you can get even better magnification for even more precise focusing. And lastly, there is no flash sync on this camera. This camera was released in 1932, and the target market was high-end photographic users. And back in the day, this was a very high-end camera. It was... I think I, I, think I remember reading it was like $130 or something like that when it was released. Maybe I have that written down. Anyway, it was a very high-end camera. And the, uh, the Raleigh Flex, which is what this is, were the top-end uh, cameras from, from Franca and... Uh, from the company that made these. And the Raleigh Cords were the entry-level ones. So there were three versions of this old standard. The old standard model 620 had a 1 to 4.5 taking lens. Uh, which is a 7.5 centimeter or 75 millimeter uh, Zeiss Tesser lens, and it's an f4.5. The 621, which is what this model is, this is a 621, 
had the 1 to 3.8 7.5 centimeters ice taking lens and the 622 had a 1 to 3.5 uh, no I take that back the 622 had the um, 1 to 3.8 lens but a different shutter the 6 uh, the 620 had I should have written these notes better the 620 and 621, this is the 621, and the 620 with the f4.5 had the same shutter, which has the 1 to 300 second uh, actu act actuation speeds on it. The 622 had a 1 to 1 500 that had a <clears throat> an additional faster s speed of 1 500th of a second built into the shutter. Okay, so of the three models, there were the 620, the 621, which is this, and the 622. The 620, the, uh, the 620 is the rarest. There were only 4,926 of the 620s made. The first one was made in January 1932 and the last one in January 1934. The old standard run itself went until 1938. The 621 uh, had 38,248 copies from January of 1932 until January of 35. And this is the 621. And then this was superseded, built concurrently with the 622, which is the same camera but with a uh, the slightly faster shutter. And that had 51,894 copies made from November of 32 until May of 1938. So the serial number run, the, this the production run for the old standards. All three models used the same serial number system. And the first old standard was serial number 200,000, 200,000. So if we assume sequential numbering, then my old standard, which is 205212, is a fairly early run. You know, there were a total of 90,000 of these things made over the course of the, uh, the six years they were made which means that that's 15,000 per year and this is 5,000 which would mean it was probably made within the first four months of the production run which is fairly early. Uh, I only have one camera that I, I can say definitively was made earlier in the production run than this and that's my K1000 which was made with, uh, within the first two months of the production run. Anyway, um, so this is a, a fairly early camera which is nice, and I don't know how many exist that are older than this one. I, I wish I had a way to find out. Uh, I would like to know how, uh, how close to the production run this was and how many predate it still. At any rate, this was uh, produced by, the brand was Raleigh, but the manufacturer was Frank and Heideke, or Franca and Heideke. I'm not really sure how that's pronounced. They're still around. They fell apart and then a bunch of the former employees regrouped into a new company and they're making very, very high-end cameras. I would love to be able to buy one, but that won't happen. Uh, and as I said, this, this old standard, and it wasn't always called the old standard. They called it the standard until 1939 when the new standard was released and then people just started calling this the old standard. So this I call it the old standard, but it's rightfully called the standard. It was made until 1938. They produced it in their Braunschweig, Germany uh, factory. Braunschweig is anglicized into Brunswick, uh, so you might have heard it called either or. It was preceded by the original Raleigh Flex. So this is only the second model that Raleigh, that Frank, uh, Franca and Heideke made. And it was preceded by the original Raleigh Flex, which took 6x6 six six images, but used 117 film. This is actually the first Raleigh that used 120 film. It was designed for 120 film, which was starting to become popular then. Uh, and it was concurrent with the other two models of the, the uh, old standard. Now, of interest, this is another important model because it was the first TLR with a crank arm to advance the film instead of a knob, making it a lot easier and a lot faster. And the crank arm did the automatic counting. You didn't have to look in the red window to make sure that things were going to line up properly. Unless you own my copy of this camera, uh, at any rate. Uh, and then this was, this was followed by, as I said, the new standard, which improved on it slightly, though I'm not a new standard expert, so I couldn't tell you exactly how it was improved. So now we're going to go through the camera's features. We're going to start with the top of the camera. 
I'm going to grab this spare battery here and see if we can prop that up a little bit. Okay, so we've got the camera top. Let's move that back. And when the viewfinder is closed, that's just what you see, is you see the closed viewfinder. So I'm going to open it here and hold this up. So you can see, when you look through the viewfinder, you don't really get much of an image, you just get my studio lamps, which are just shop lamps. They're nothing glamorous. But that's what you use, what you look through. And so you've got the viewfinder on top. The eye, oh, yeah, this is an interesting thing. This is the only Raleigh with this feature. This is called the sport finder. When you flip up just the top, but not the whole viewfinder. And in the center of the sport finder, in the center of the sport finder, there's that little circle. And that circle is actually a mirror. And what this, the way this is engineered is that when you look through the dot, through the hole in the center, you can see your pupil in the mirror when the image is correctly aligned with the film plane. So if you have everything pre-focused and you're anticipating a shot, all you have to do is pop that up and look through it, and then you know exactly when to take it. And that's, that's like I said, the only, the only model Raleigh that has that. It's really kind of a nifty feature and well-engineered, and unfortunately this type of sport finder fell out of favor for a more complex mirror-based one where the light bounces around and stuff. It's, it's an interesting design, but required more complex engineering with more things to fall apart. <clears throat> anyway, there's also, let's see if I can get these to close, we have this magnifying glass. So when you're looking at the view, viewfinding screen to focus, there we go. Let me see if I can actually get this on the camera. You can see, so you have this magnifying glass and you can look through it to get a more fine focus detail in your image, which is incredibly useful because the focusing screen, while, while acceptable, uh, is also using very old technology and it doesn't focus as well as the lens or the film can and so you sometimes will lose some image quality relying just on the focusing screen. We also have the depth of field scale. Uh, on the back here there's a chart There's a chart that I don't have. There we go. Now you can see it. And that says on the left, inf so infinity at 1 to 3.8 focuses from 20 feet to infinity, and at f22 focuses from 3 feet to, inf or 3 meters to infinity. That's probably not feet. At, uh, at focused at the closest distance, which is 1.8 meters, at f3.8 it focuses from 1. 0.65 meters to 2 meters and at f22 from 1.2 meters to 3.7. So basically this is the hyperfocal distance chart up here so that if you are focusing on things you know since there's no depth of field preview it gives you an idea of what's going to be in focus in your image based on your distance to subject and aperture. There's also supposed to be right up here a locking catch and the locking catch holds this in place and then when you pop up the sport finder it holds everything else in place. I don't have the locking catch and that's a real pain, believe me. That thing's popping up all the time by itself and it's just the locking catch would be nice to have. Uh, we also have the locking lever which is part of the locking catch and then there's the lens hood and the lens hood is this assembly that pops up around the viewing screen so it's actually more of a viewing screen hood. And the shutter cocking and actuating. Oh wait, sorry, skip the line. And then the viewing screen itself, which I showed you looking at the light through. So that's the viewing screen. It's a little bit out of focus because I'm not focused on the light. This camera actually could not focus on the light. It's way too close. It does not, it's not a close focus camera at all. So we're going now to the front of the camera. And on the front, we have the viewing lens, which is right here. This is a 3.1 helioscope. 
And then we have the taking lens, which is the 3.8 Zeiss Tesser. Uh, we have the control window. Shutter, oh yeah, that's on the top of the front here. Up here we have a what's called the control window. And when you adjust, let's see if we can get, there we go. You can see it moving when I adjust the shutter speed. It goes from T up to 1 300th of a second. And then adjusting the aperture goes from slightly smaller than f22, probably about f27, down to f3.8. So when you're, and the way this is designed, and the reason it's like this is so that when you're looking through the camera viewfinder, you can also look right in front of it and see what your settings are. And then you can reference your settings against the uh, depth of field scale table. Uh, the front also has the stop set. Uh, so here is the stop setting lever right here on this side. This sets the aperture, and then we have the shutter speed lever, which is right here. And then that sets the shutter speed. The shutter cocking lever. Let me make sure I'm at an actual shutter speed here, one tenth of a second. That's fine. So here's the shutter cocking lever. To actuate the shutter, you first have to prime it, basically get the springs ready to fire, and then that activates the shutter. And so if we have it at a different speed, that's time. Push it open, push it close. That should be bulb. Nope, that's bulb. Nope, it's not, never mind. That was a full second. Let's get back to bulb here. Here's bulb. Push it open, hold it, release it, and it closes. Then we go all the way to 1 300th of a second. And it's just a little flash like that. The, uh, so that's the shutter cocking and actuating lever. Then over here we have the cable release port. It's built into the side right here. It's very hard to see. I demonstrated except that mine doesn't work. <clears throat> so moving on to the camera sides and back. This is the right side when you face the camera. This is the shutter focusing knob. And what this does is physically move the lens. So the further the lens goes out from the body, the closer the focus. And you might have noticed that I actually rotated this two full turns. The knob is marked for one full turn from infinity down to some number, 1.7 meters. But you can go slightly closer than that with one more full turn, which takes you down to about 1.3 meters. And that's not an accident. Uh, Frankie and, and Heideke uh, actually designed it like that intentionally, and they talk about it in the instruction manual as an intentional design um, detail. This is a uh, lug to hold the um, camera case in place. This is part of my strap system. The camera case for this thing is in, it's disintegrating quickly. So I set it up to hold, to take its, uh, take my straps instead, um, which works fine. I have a lens cap for it, so that protects the taking lens. This is part of the um, film tensioning system. This holds the film spool in place inside the camera, which we'll see in just a minute when we get inside of the camera. Going over to the other side, we have the film advance crank. This is the, the film count window. Now, on a properly functioning one of these, this would display the number of frames that have been taken. I don't have a properly functioning one of these, so it, it, it doesn't. It counts and then it behaves properly with each frame, kind of, but it doesn't actually display the number. And when I say kind of, it's because this camera only fits 11 frames on a 120 roll. It's supposed to fit 12. And that's because it spaces every, it, it cranks everything like the first frame. So it advances the um, spool just a little bit too much uh, for the later, later frames. And then the space between the frames gets longer and longer and eventually an entire frame gets eaten up with that. This button right here resets the frame count. So if you're taking, if you've taken a picture, advanced, hey, now it's working, kind of. One, two. You might be able to see the numbers actually advancing. I think my camera is showing off for the video. Three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight. Now when these were made, the film only took six or nine exposures. Modern 120 takes 12. So when you get to nine, you have to reset it and then take a couple more. And you reset it that way. Just push the button and it resets. If you keep cranking, that can risk damaging the mechanism. And you don't definitely don't want to do that on these old cameras. So those are the two things on the, this camera side. Uh, then shutter cable port. Oh, I talked about that. Oh, and then the back. Okay, so the camera back wraps around, wraps around the camera. And this is this is the starting of the back. This is the uh, exposure. Oh yeah, this is the exposure table. So this tells you what your subject is and some recommended exposure settings. This is a film window, and the oldest of the old old standards came with a rubber plug that went into the top and bottom film windows. So after you got the film set up, you just plugged that, and you didn't have to uh, risk light being the film being fogged by the light. Honestly, it's not really an issue. I've never had a problem with that. Um, I'm, I have a problem with the light leak in this camera, but that's different. So this is indicates that it's, you you line up the one here if you're using B1 film, which is six exposure six by six, and it takes six exposures. And this indicates that you line up the B2 film, which takes uh, nine exposures. Uh, there's no hole for lining up the 120, so I just line it up with here with this one. Um, so this is the film back. The, and then on the film bottom, we, you saw we have the secondary red window here. Let me get a better angle on it. Secondary red window, uh, tripod bushing, and the film back release. So we pop up the film back. And now we can see inside the camera. Now the film back, all of the old standards could be could take plates film plates, which is a, something that's probably a foreign concept to most everyone alive today, including me. And uh, all you had to do for that was take the back off. Take the back off, which also helps for the video seeing what's in here. And then there was something called a Raleigh kin, which was a film pl a f um, glass plate adapter that you would put into the camera, and the glass plates would would I think take up this whole back space right here. Be, they'd be a little bit larger, so you'd have a little room to handle them with. But then they would still take the standard 6x6 six six image. Glass plates had some advantages over film in that uh, for people who are into really advanced photography, such as doing things like infrared, you could buy a standard glass plate and the infrared sensitizing dies, and then sensitize the, the glass plate for infrared at home, which was pretty cool. And uh, something that's just not available to modern film photographers. Uh, I guess that's not true. You can make your own glass plates and your own emulsions and then sensitize them with the dyes. But it's not available to modern film photographers who don't want to die of cancer in our 20s. Uh, at any rate. So then we've got uh, inside the camera. This is where the take-up spool goes. So when you advance the film crank, this, this spins, the film arm, this spins, and that takes up the, the spool. And then to release the spool, you just pull out on this, and then it's supposed to fall out. Uh, because there's actually more film on these modern spools, um, they, uh, and because also, I found with this one, the plastic spools don't pop out of this very well at all because they're a little bit bulkier, but the metal spools fall right out. Um, I haven't used 620 film, 120 metal spools work fine. And you can see here's the uh, image area with the lens. And here's where the actual film image uh, is taken. And then this is pretty nifty. You put the film in here. Let's see if we can get a better, better light on that. Put the film in here. And then there's a little lever here. And what you do is you push down on the lever and it ejects the spool when you're done. It makes it very easy to get that out of there. And then, of course, you've got a, stand, a, a film roller system with three rollers. And that helps keep the, the film flat on plane while it's inside of the camera. And the last thing about the back is here's how you put the back back on. Now the uh, there's a little knob protruding right here and this side is a sp has a spring right here. This is this is a spring. This side is is not as much of a spring. And so you start by putting the knob the little nub end right in there, pushing a little bit, tilting it into place. And then the spring pushes it back into alignment 
and you can shut it. And it's, so it's really easy to, to interchange the backs or something like that. So if you have a good camera with a bad back and a good back with a bad camera, now you've actually got one good camera. I'm fairly sure, certain nobody actually has that problem. So some notes on this camera. It is 100% mechanical. It vastly predates the days of electronics and camera. There's no battery for it or anything like that. Uh, just showed you the film plate adapter. This was the first Raleigh Flex to use 120 film. It can also accept 620 and 117 film. Good luck finding 117 film. I don't think it's been made in decades. It's the only 6x6 Raleigh Flex with a sport finder. There were some 4x4 Raleigh Flexes that had the same setup. This was the camera, This not this exact one, but the, the exact one is in a museum somewhere, but this model was the camera used by Robert Kappa to photograph World War II and take some of the most inc incredible pictures that um, were taken during the war. The lens mirror angle uh, and image reduction in this, so, so when you have two lenses like this you're going to get parallax because you're seeing something from two different angles. So imagine, imagine that you're standing, you have a triangle and uh, you've got one point of the triangle up here and then two points down here. Well, each view from these other two points is going to be different. Well, you have one subject and two views, so that's creating a triangle, which is going to cause parallax, which is mostly a problem close up. However, the engineers basically fixed that and the way that they mounted the mirror and the shape of the mirror inside it corrects much of the parallax distortion, so what you see in the viewfinder is actually very, very close to what is actually going to be on the film. Talked about the models. Oh yeah, and some camera don'ts. For this camera, you can't really touch the shutter. It's not easy to get to without taking the camera apart. So, but still don't touch the shutter. Don't touch the mirror, because the mirrors back then could still be desilvered and, and were fragile. Uh, don't touch the lens. The lens is uncoated. There's no coating whatsoever on the glass, but it's optical glass so it's still soft and can still be damaged by the oils on your fingers. Uh, so, and don't use this in, leave this in your car because of heat damage. Don't store it in a plastic bag because you'll get fungus. And both of those things can ruin a camera very quickly. Don't let your camera get wet because getting your camera wet is a, a good way to ruin it as well. And just remember that your camera is a precision tool and should be handled and cared for and treated with respect. And as long as you do that, it will last you for a very, very long time. So normally in my camera videos, this is the part where I switch over and start doing a second video. But because these old cameras are a lot simpler in terms of the amount of stuff to talk about with them, uh, I, I do the old cameras in one shot. So we're going to now talk about how to load film. And, you know, there's no battery There's no in this, there's no lens to mount or unmount, so, so the film is really about the most complicated thing that we have to um, have go over with this. So I have here a roll of film paper. Uh, there's no film in it, just the paper backing, and a metal take-up spool. And you can use plastic, they're just tricky to get out of here, out of the top. Uh, they are not tricky to get out of the bottom at all. Everything is tricky to get into the top, however. There we go. So what you have to do is you have to angle it in, catch the, uh, catch the sprocket with the opening, and then drop the rest of it in, all while holding this out. So it's tricky, but not impossible. So then the film goes in the bottom here. Just like that. And I'll show you when, when the film is done, there's this little lever here and you just push it, and that pushes the spool right out. And we'll see that again once this film is actually done. So you would take your film and pull it forward a little bit. We're going to advance, and we're going to see if we can get this to catch. There we go. And now, the way that I'm advancing it goes negative one, zero, and now this next frame is going to count one, which means that I'm going to have to reset. So, 
per in a in a perfectly functional one, you would advance the start to right about here, and then you'd put the you'd shut the door. I took it off for demonstration purposes, which I'll do again. But you'd shut the door and advance this until the number one pops up. After these dots. And actually what you'd want to do is reset it before you get to that. Well, you can reset it now because it'll advance properly and everything. So you advance until you see the number one in here. And then you hit the reset button. And what will happen is you'll get 11 counts off of the, off of the um, uh, film advance, which might also be part of the reason why I'm only getting 11 frames per roll. But um, anyway. So you would take your picture and pretend I've taken a picture. The, the film advance is not in any way connected to taking a picture, which makes things like double exposures very easy. You just have to take a second photo without advancing it. Advance, take a picture, advance. And the middle set of numbers are the ones that you'll be seeing through the red hole. Or if you have the plug or a later old standard which has a sliding door, you wouldn't see them at all. But you can see that with this one, numbers aren't lining up exactly perfectly. I'm gonna reset that so I don't damage the mechanism by over cranking it. There we go. Just advance it all the way. Oops, did not like doing that. Uh, the film. The film paper got a little bit out of alignment on there because I didn't have the film back on. The film back does a lot to help guide the uh, paper into place, but that's okay because the spool still popped out fairly easily. Don't want to damage that. And now with the, uh, with the film completely taken and sealed and off to be developed and Lots of prize-winning photos shared with the world. As soon as I finish rewrapping this paper. Then the next thing to do is take out this spool by pushing up on that lever. Grab the spool. You can push that down. You don't have to. It'll get pushed back down when you put the next roll in. And then this spool gets put in the top of the camera waiting for the next roll of film. So that's the sports finder. Uh, this is the last thing we're going to do before we call it a day. And then I'm going to share, you, share some photos with you uh, after the video that I've taken with this camera uh, to show you some, the, the image quality. But that's the sports finder, and that's the little mirror that we're looking at right there. And the way you use it is you basically put your nose on the back of the camera, uh, on the back of the uh, viewfinder down here. And then when you can see your pupil reflecting back at you, you're lined up properly. And uh, that's that. So that's the that's the Raleigh Flex. And and one last thing, if you have lost the lens cap or don't have a lens cap, you can use a 25 millimeter camcorder lens cap instead for the taking lens. The viewing lens does not have any ridges on it, so lens caps won't actually fit on there. But uh, the taking lens takes a 25 millimeter and that's uh, that's a nice tip a nice a nice backup plan in case you don't have a uh, lens cap so as always if this video was helpful please give me a thumbs up that lets me know I'm on the right track if you would like to subscribe to see more photo videos in the future you can just subscribe using the button right down there uh, if you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comments section. Also, ideas for videos, and if I have the knowledge and equipment to do it, I'd be more than happy to record the video. And lastly, thank you guys for watching.